prayer or in the middle of the prayer that is called the jilsa or the julus, the actual sitting. The last one is a rukun from the arkan of the salat. If a person doesn't make it, then his salat is rendered null and void. It's something that there's no room for it to be forgotten or even for mistakes to be made in it. And there are many issues connected to this. We'll deal with about five or six of them. So we're going to deal with today the sitting and the mistakes that are made during the jilsa or the julus, as well as some of the mistakes that are contained within the tashahud Again, I want to repeat, this sitting is imperative. There are certain things that if you don't do them in your prayer, then although your prayer is not complete, still you don't have to redo your prayer. But this is a rukun from the arkan of the prayer. It is a pillar by which the prayer is predicated upon. So concerning the issue of the jalsa or the julus from the mistakes especially again as I mentioned the people who learn the prayer from their parents and their medhat and they don't go back to try to see what's out there and to investigate is the statement that some people make today as I mentioned the 8th of Sha'ban 1436 years after the hijrah the person doing the tashahud, he sends salams upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the durood al-sharif. And he says, As-salam alayka ya ayyuhal nabi. I send you the salams, ya ayyuhal nabi. As if the person is talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the Arabic language that is called the mukhatab when a person is talking to someone who is right in front of him, as opposed to someone who is ghaib and he's not there. So when the beginning of Al-Islam, when the Muslims learned how to pray, the Prophet taught them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that they should say that. As the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud clearly indicates and suggests, in Sahih al-Bukhari, may Allah be pleased with Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he said that they asked the Prophet, what should we say upon you when we're praying? And he went through the whole thing and he told them when they came to the salams that they should say to him, As-salamu alayka ya ayyuhan nabi. We are giving salams to you, ya ayyuhan nabi. And you're sitting right in front of us and you're living with us. You are being addressed by us. But then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion, he said, May Allah be pleased with him. When the Prophet died, we stopped saying that. We stopped mentioning the salams to him as if he was there. And we started to say, As-salam ala nabi As-salam ala nabi Peace be upon the Nabi. And they call that the addressing for the person who is absent. And this again goes to show Akhwani, the importance of the issue of a tawheed and how the companions were the furthest people away from making dua to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and addressing him in a way where there are some problems that can be developed or created where some misunderstanding is produced. One of the major tabi'een from the tabi'een, those people were taught by the companions, is the great scholar and imam al ta Ibn Abi Rabah. Ata learned from the companions. In Sayyid al Bukhari, Ata, Rahmatullah Ali, he said, After the death of the Prophet, وسلم, from what we witnessed from the companions, we, the Tabi'een, we didn't see the Prophet, وسلم, we saw the companions, and they were the ones who taught us. Ata said, From what we witnessed is that they taught us when we came to the Tashahud. That we would say, As-salam ala nabi. We would give the salam to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, as if he wasn't there. Now, if a person says, As-salam alayka ya ayyuhan nabi, 
peace be upon you, a Nebi, and you're here today and you're saying that as if you're speaking to him. I'm not going to say that your prayer is Baltila and it doesn't count, but that's a mistake in the prayer. And you don't have precision and concentration and perfection in your prayer. Because as I mentioned, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, the Tabi al taat they came and they made that distinction. And as I mentioned, both of those ethers, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud as well as al taat they've been collected by Imam al-Bukhari. So the one who explained the ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, al-Imam ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he said, what we understand from these athar and these ahadith is that there has to be a mughayra. There is a distinction and a difference that during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, the people gave him salams as if they were speaking to him, directing it to him. But after he died, sallallahu wa sallam, they started to say it as if he was absent. Again, it goes to show the importance of a tawheed and not calling on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a way in which he can hear you. And it also goes to show the issue that we've been saying many times that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he died. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he died. But after his death, he is living in a special way in the barzakh like everybody else from Bani Adam. Every single person from Bani Adam who has died, he is dead, but he's living in the barzakh. No one is different. No one is different in that. Fir'aun or other than Fir'aun. So that's the first point. That when you make the salat, you come to that tashahud and you make the shahadatain and you want to give the salams, you should say, As-salamu ala nabi. I give my peace and blessings, salutations upon the nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another mistake, and we mentioned the sister or the cousin of this mistake last week. And the same proofs that we used last week to deal with its cousin, it can be used this week to deal with this relative as well. And that is, when people make the tashahud and they come to the durood al-sharif, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained to the companions what to say. And there are two narrations and that's it. There's not a third, four, five, six. There are two narrations. And we should stick with those two. And we shouldn't go beyond it, nor should we take away from it. And addition and subtraction is something that people do in this issue. So what's the ziyada? Some people, when they give the durood al-sharif in the salat, they say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi. And they use the Sayyid because he is a Sayyid. We do not negate and we do not take away that to him is a siyada. He is a sayyid that's established from his correct characteristics. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Ana sayyidu bani adam wa la fakhr. I am the sayyid of Adam's children. I'm the master, I'm the best of all of Adam's children. And I'm not saying that to brag, he said in an authentic hadith. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we don't negate and we don't argue that he is the Sayyid. But when he told the companions what to do and what to say in the prayer, he did not put this in there. So it shouldn't be done. And as we mentioned last week, some people who they don't care about the precision that is in our religion in terms of principles, like the principle, the ibadat of al-Islam are I need you brothers who are students from amongst you to remember that word from the verb waqafa, yaqifu. Waqafa means to stop, to stop. Qif, stop. Tawqifiyya. Wal, qaf, fa. Waqafa. Waqif, at-tawakuf. Tawqifiyya means don't do it until you have proofs. When it comes to the ibadat of al-Islam, ya ummat al-Islam, don't do anything that you don't have a delil for it, a proof for it. And if we were to embark upon doing things that there is no delil, we just do it because it feels good. He is the Sayyid, isn't he? Yes, he's the Sayyid, but he didn't say it here, so don't you say it there. 
This is what happened to the Yehud and the Nasara. They were liberal and they were generous. And as a result of that, they have a religion. If Musa came, if Isa ibn Maryam came, so was Salam alayhima. If they came back right now, they would not know that religion. If Prophet Muhammad came, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wouldn't know a lot of what the Muslims are doing in the shahadatain, in the salat zakat, in Som, and in hajj. Person is performing the hajj, and he wants to throw the stones at the jamarat, which is from the best ibadat in al-Islam. So when he's in Muzdalifa, after Arafah day, the sun goes down, he goes to Muzdalifa, and he prays Salat al-Maghrib and Isha. Three rakat, two rakat, he combines them, and then he goes to sleep. People begin to look for the rocks in Muzdalifa. Why? Allahu alam. Why Muzdalifa? So instead of the person who had to make it all the way from Arafah, long distance, Arafah, to Muzdalifa, when the Prophet arrived at Muzdalifa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made Salat al-Maghrib, three rakat, and then Isha, and he went to sleep. Why? The distance is far from there to there, and the next day is a big jihad. He didn't stay up making dhikr of Allah, reading the Quran. He didn't do that. He went to sleep right away, having the rahmah upon the community. So what do the Muslims do? They get books about Muzdalifa, and they get to Muzdalifa, and you find many people walking in the nighttime with flashlights looking for rocks. Is it enough that they get rocks from Muzdalifa? No, that's not enough. Once they get the rocks from Muzdalifa, he goes into his sack and he pulls out his sack and he has like a water bottle that has Zemzem water in it. He brought it from Mecca and he puts 21 rocks in the Zemzem bottle so that they can boil overnight to get the baraka. So when he throws them at the Jamara, he's really going to smash Shaitan's head in. This is the religion. If the Nabi came back, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, why are you doing that, Ya Abdullah? Muzdali for rock, Zamzam water, and all. The person says, it feels good. Is Zamzam is baraka and Muzdali for the rocks. No. Just stop where he stopped. And that's why Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he used to tell the people, Qif, Haythuma waqaf al qawm. Stop where the companions stop. Don't put your foot in the arena about a particular issue that you don't have a delil and you don't have ulama who have preceded you to that particular issue. So as it relates to the issue of Sayyidina, Allahumma salli ala, ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, don't say Sayyid. And that's because of the delil of the hadith that we told you of Al-Bara ibn Azib when the Prophet asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do you say before you go to sleep? He said, Allah and his messenger know best what I say before I go to sleep. He told him, make a wudu, make a good wudu, lay on your right side and make this dua, as we mentioned last week. And in that dua is the statement that the Prophet told him, وَآمَنْتُ بِنَبِيِّكَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلْتَ I believe in the Nabi that you sent, Ya Allah. I believe in your Nabi. And he went through the whole dua. He said to him, okay, al bara now tell me the hadith, tell me the dua back. He said everything exactly the way it should be said. But when he came to this part, instead of saying, I believe in the Nabi that you sent, he said, I believe in the Rasul that you sent. Nabi, Rasul, is the same person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when he changed one word for the other word, when al bara ibn Azib said Rasul, but the Prophet told him to say Nabi, and he said Rasul, the Prophet stopped him and said, An Nabi Alevi Arsalt. Nabi Yekalevi Arsalt. Say the Nabi. And then he did it again and he put it back and said the right word. What does the person have to say who comes and he says, What are you talking about? So what if I say Sayyid, he's our Sayyid? Why are you making a big deal about did the Prophet? Would you accuse him of making a big deal or a small deal about? the difference between Nabi and the Sayyid. Because of that hadith and other hadith, those scholars of Islam, some of them were of the opinion you shouldn't even narrate the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam by giving the meaning. You should say it the way it was said. Because he made dua for the people who do that. <laughs> 
May Allah illuminate and give light to the face of the person who hears my hadith and then he transmits it and he reads it and he relays it the exact way that I said it. So Allah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made dua for the people who memorize and they say it the right way. And this is how the religion of the Yehud and the Nasara, this is how it got lost. This is one of the ways that it got lost. That people started to become relaxed and laxed in what the Prophet was saying and what the Prophets were not saying until they started taking liberties. And this is to the point where now a person wants to say a hadith and it's not even authentic. It's not even remotely close to what he said. I can see if someone said Rasul instead of Nebi because it doesn't change the meaning of the hadith so there's really no conflict. And that's the position of the majority of the ulama. That as long as what you say, it renders the meaning of the hadith, then you don't have to say it exactly. You don't have to say it exactly. Exactly, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That's the exact way. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ But if a person says, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ He made a little difference. There's a little difference in what he said. But the same thing, the meaning comes across. They said, if you do that, as long as you don't change the meaning. But what we have today is, the person is changing the meaning and he's bringing and he's entering to the equation what is not from the religion. Now, that's outside of the prayer. If the person wanted to say, Sayyiduna Muhammad, he wants to give the khutbah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, comes his name. He says, I will say it, no problem. No problem. He hears his name and he says, Sayyidun, no problem. You can say that, no problem. But when it comes to an issue of the prayer of the Prophet وسلم, that he taught us, then we should stick to what he said. Again, Al Imam Ibn Hajr, he was asked the question because there is some ikhtilaf. Some of the scholars, some of the people of knowledge in the madahib, they say, you could say Sayyid. They asked Ibn Hajr about this issue. Ibn Hajr said, what is the best case that there's no ikhtilaf in and that the slave will be saved and free from any blame, Yom al Qiyamah, is to stick to the alfaz that are thabita. Stick to what has been authentically established. From the mistakes, Ikhwani as well, in the particular issue is the tashahud, some people make a distinction between the first one and the second one. So if you were to learn how to pray for the first time, many of the Muslims would tell you that if you're making Salat al-Maghrib, if you're making Salat al-Dhuhr al-Asr al-Isha, then in the first tashahd when you're sitting there, at-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu, you go through all of that, and then you stop before you come to the Durood al-Sharif. And there's no delil for that distinction. As a matter of fact, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ brought us a hadith when they taught the people the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ and they showed from what he taught them and what they did. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa radiyallahu anhum is that in both of those tashahud, you go through the whole thing in both of them. The first one, you don't say some. And then the second one, you say all of it. In the first tashahud, you don't say all of it. In the second one, you say some. No, you say the whole thing in both of them. Not only that, but after the first tashahud, if you go through the whole tahiyyatu lillah, you go through all of it, you can still stay there and make other dua. Your own dua if you want. Dua from the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or dua from yourself. You go through the whole tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And you go through all of that and you're in the first tashahad. What's that, the door? Fire alarm? Who knows how to take care of that? I saw Amr, Amr, he went in there. If a person goes through the whole Durud al-Sharif after praying two rakahs for Dhuhr Asr, 
Maghrib, Al Isha, two rakah. He went through the whole thing. And then he wanted to make other dua that is permissible for him. And then he gets up for the third rakat. He reads and then he gets back down. And then he, can go, he goes through the whole thing again. What's the proof? The proof of that is that, again, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and what was collected by the Imam Ahmed and other than him, he said that the Prophet told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا قَعَدْتُمْ فِي كُلِّ رَكَعَتَيْنِ فَقُولُوا He said, if you people sit down, after every rakatain, then you should say. And then he told him what to say. At And he went through the whole thing. So after every two rakat, if the prayer only has two rakat, like the Eid, like the two rakat of greeting the masjid, like the two rakat of al Juma, then it's easy. You have to say the whole thing. But if the salat has three rakat, four rakat, then again he commanded after every two rakat you should say and then he told them to say the whole thing now the question is why do we have in the books of fiqh a distinction where they tell you after the first two rakat you only say so much and then when you do the last tashahud then you say the whole thing where does it come from it's not my job to figure that out there are weak hadith that establish it Allah knows best is from the ijtihadat and the istihsanat of some of the people who went before us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and to accept it from them as well. As well. Number three, ikhwani. And this is an issue that I'm going to mention only because there's a bigger picture. And this is why I'm mentioning this particular issue. Or I would have let it go. Because I know it's an issue of ikhtilaf. And the ikhtilaf in this issue is... And ikhtilaf that you can appreciate more than the issue we just mentioned about the durood al-sharif. And that is moving the finger in the tashahud. Moving the finger in the tashahud. When the companions describe the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like the companion Wa'il ibn Hujr radiallahu anhu and other than him, he said that when the Prophet ﷺ came to the tashahud and he started saying, At-tahiyyatu lillah. As soon as he got in the tashahud and the jilsa, he put his finger like this and he pointed this sababa, the pointing finger. Each finger in Arabic, it has a name. Someone cuts this finger off, he has to pay so much money for cutting this finger off. Someone cuts this finger off, he pays more money. Because it's the finger of a tawheed. So each one of them, they have a name. The companion said that from the very beginning, he would put his left hand on his left knee, he would put his right hand on his right knee, and he would make a circle like this. Some companions said like that, some said like that. It's up to you. Do this sometimes, do that sometimes, always do this, always do that. The important thing is that you make a circle and you point towards the Qibla. They said that when he made this halqa, when he made this, he would look at it. So he wasn't looking straight. He wasn't looking at the place of sajda, as I mentioned before. That when a person is praying, he's looking at the place of sajda, as the companions told us about his prayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When did he take his eyes off of the place of sajda? We told you some of those examples. When they were praying in the desert, he thought that something was going to happen and he looked and he went back to concentrating. He allowed the person, if something is going to harm him, a snake, a scorpion, he can look at that thing and then solve the problem. One of the times when he took his eyes off of the place of a sajda is doing the jilsa and the tashahud. He would look and focus upon his finger and from the beginning to the end, he would say, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. He didn't keep his fingers on his knee. And then when he came to Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, he did it. He didn't do that. From the very beginning, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. All the way through the shahadatain, all the way through his salams, all the way to the durood al-sharif. 
Now, there's a big ikhtilaf between people of the sunnah as to whether the person should move his finger or he shouldn't move his finger. This is an issue that those of you who have the ability to go and to discuss it and to study it, you should do that. If you don't have that ability, then you can blindly follow someone who you respect. And from the people who took that position, from the latter scholars and people before him, was Nasr al-Din al-Albani. And in his book, Sifat al-Salat al-Nabi, he tried to show that this is the thing you should do, and he showed that this was the position of Imam Ahmed and others. Other people took the other position, and it appears that the other position is the stronger position, that you should not move your finger. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of the discussion because it is a highly specialized issue. It has to do with the men in the narration. But for the most part, all of the men in the narration who said you should do this without moving it, all of them are good. But there is one person who said you should move it. He's good too. He's fiqh, he's good. But he's not better than those people. Those people are more in number and those people are more in knowledge. It's like Al Imam Ibn Majah, who's a good scholar in hadith. He says that it's red, Bukhari, Muslim, Ahmed, Al Imam Malik, and they said it's blue. These four people, because of their level, because of their weight, because of their numbers, they tend to have more weight than this one individual. He's not bad. He's a good person. He's knowledgeable. He's acceptable. But how is it that all of these people over here, they said that he just pointed it, and this is the only one who came, and he said that you should move it. And it's a highly technical issue. So he went against the one who said this, the man's name is Zaida ibn Qudama. He's a good narrator. He said that the Prophet moved it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he brought a chain of narration. And he said that they said that the Prophet moved it. But people who are on his level, the same level of him, in terms of when he lived, they brought the same chain of narration. And none of them said that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, moved his finger. And they were all bigger than him. Sufyan al Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Abu Awana. And we're not mentioning these names because we're a group of people who put a lot of emphasis on the name, the names. Not about the name. It's about the weightiness of those individuals. So it seems like this hadith is shad. For those of you who speak Arabic and you also look at this book on the internet, there's a student of Sheikh Muqbil, Kunyaz Abu Mundir, Ahmed ibn Sa'id ibn Ali al Ash. Habi al Hujri. He wrote this book and he called this book Al Bashara fi Shadud Tahrik al Uzbur fi Tashahud. This is a refutation against Al Albani's position. He says, No, you shouldn't move it. And he dealt with what Al Albani said and he refuted him in a nice way. And this is why I'm bringing this point more than anything else. He's one of the students of a Sheikh Muqbil, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And as Sheikh Muqbil, he wrote the introduction of this book. Usually when a scholar writes an introduction to someone's book, he'll say, I read the book, and the book was really good. I advise you to read it. He really proved this and proved. Sheikh Muqbil didn't do that in this book. He didn't say he supported this book or he's against this book. He's against Al-Albani or he's with Al-Albani. But what Sheikh Muqbil did in the introduction was he praised the author of the book, for the way he did his research. He did it with respect. As Sheikh Muqbil talked about the evil of al ikhtilaf Ikhtilaf and how if a person doesn't know how to have ikhtilaf, then we're going to have animosity, enmity, and we're going to have intolerance, and we're going to hate each other. And this is what we find with the Muslims today. An issue, there's justified ikhtilaf in it, but if you don't take my position, I'm going to bully you. And you know on the internet with emails and trolling and stuff like that, Muslims have this bullying thing as well. Not just our children in school, Muslims have this bullying. What do you think about Sheikh so-and-so? I really don't want to deal with that because I'm learning a religion. And then the person bullies you into taking a position. This is not our religion. So that's the book that was written in this regard. 
those of you who have the ability to go and to read the situation, it is easy, in my opinion. It's easy. It's not that difficult. But the ikhtilaf is mu'tabr. It is legitimate and it is considered. Al-Albani, if he's right, he'll get two rewards. If he's wrong, he'll get one reward. The Shaykh here, Abu Mundhir, if he's right, he'll get two rewards. If he's wrong, he'll get one reward. But you see how the ikhtilaf of the Muslim, the people of the Sunnah, sincere people, the ikhtilaf is in what they write. He took this position and he took that position. Whereas the people today, our ikhtilaf is in our hearts. Our ikhtilaf is in our blood. We hate each other, our relatives, and other than that, just because they take another position. So I believe that this is a mistake that it shouldn't be done. person should just point his finger and that is it. For the one who wants to see the other side, obviously, Sufat al-Salat al-Nabi, those of you who have that in English, Al-Albani makes a big effort to support that particular point of view, as well as in his book, Tamam al-Minna, in his explanation of Sharh al-Sunnah. Another issue, Ikhwani, from the mistakes, and I've seen this in our masjid, and I believe it's an attempt on brothers' parts who are trying to do the sunnah, is that some people, they point their fingers and they move it between the two sajdas. So the person goes from, Sami Allah liman hamida rabbana wa lakal hamd. Allahu Akbar. And then he goes into sajda. Subhana rabbi al-a'la, subhana rabbi al-a'la, subhana rabbi al-a'la. And then he says, Allahu Akbar. And then he points. And then he says, Allahu Akbar. And then he gets up and he points. And then he gets up. This position is a position that some of the scholars of al-Hadith have taken, especially from Pakistan. One of the greatest ulama of al-Hadith who came to this masjid is the Sheikh Badi al-Din Shah Sandi. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He came to Green Lane Masjid years ago. And he gave some da'wah and some lessons here. And he was a tremendous scholar in al-Hadith. He made intisar to this particular point of view based upon a hadith that appears to be weak. And Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Am I in a position to say that? That scholar is so much bigger than me. I'm a revert. Before I was born, he was learning this religion. He knew this religion. Yeah, I have the right to say that. And you have the right to say that I'm wrong. And you have the right to say that Umar radiallahu anhu was wrong in something that you know this particular thing is wrong based upon the Quran, based upon the Sunnah. And then there are those issues where it's the gray areas, ikhtilaf in that area. This is an issue of ikhtilaf. It appears that that hadith is da'if. Again, there's another sheikh. He's not as famous as he used to be because of the fitting that was going on. But his name is, his kunya is Abu Abdurrahman, Fawzi al-Athari. It's from al-Bahrain. Fawzi al-Athari. He wrote this book. And this book is called, Kanuz al-Nahrain fi bayan da'af hadith al-Ishara bi sababa bayn al-Sajdatain. This book is just dealing with, bringing and dealing with the hadith that says, when you come from sajda, you should point. So I encourage the brothers who take this position, don't take the position just to be gharib. Don't do that. And I'm not accusing anyone's niyat. But when you just get one position and you never saw the other position, it's okay. But once you know that there's another position, you should make it your business. Try to go and try to see the other position. Is the Sheikh Fawzi al-Athari ghafar ali wa lahu wa lakum? Does it mean that he is a bigger scholar than the Sheikh Badi al-Din? La wallahi. La wallahi. But how many times have we mentioned and how many times have we shown that knowledge is not based upon age, it's not based upon who's been doing it the most. We gave a talk here about how the <coughs> companions used to rectify the mistakes that they make. One person would be from the tabi'een and he corrects Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. No problem. The dalil in our religion is the Quran and the Sunnah. So that's a mistake. Those of you who want to do that, point between the two sajdas, 
The salat is tawqifiyya. It is ibadah. That particular hadith appears to be clearly da'if, and therefore it should be avoided. But if you take the issue and you study both issues, then inshallah, bihi wa ni'mah. The last issue, Akhwani, that we want to deal with concerning today and the tashahud concerning today is the issue of the importance of actually pointing in that tashahud. And Imam al nawawi in his book, Rawdat al-Talibin, he said that if a person's hand, his right hand is cut off, he shouldn't make the tashahud with his left hand. And that's because there were some companions who had left hands only. Some companions who had left hands. And we don't get any narrations where they came to the Nabi wasallam and they asked, what should we do? And because of the importance of the right hand and how when it comes to the issue of al-ishara and establishing the shahadatain and this issue is an issue again that is tawqifiyah. Another person could say, but what about the ayat? Fear Allah to the best of your ability. If he doesn't have a right hand, then he's forced to eat with his left hand. He's forced to drink and give and take with his left hand. Although the shaitan gives, eat, drinks, he takes with his left hand. It's an issue of ikhtilaf. And this issue is not as big as, it's not as big as some of the issues that come to us, but it just goes to show. Those scholars of Al-Islam, they didn't leave any mas'ala except that they addressed it and they dealt with it. And what we have to do is we have to appreciate what was said, what was put before us. We have to know how to approach it and how to deal with it. And we have to be balanced. There is some ikhtilaf. We don't pay attention to it because it is a waste of time. Even if the scholar said it or that scholar, it's a waste of time. And then there's that ikhtilaf where no one should come and minimize it and say, what's the difference between Rasul and Nabi? Stop splitting the issue like that. Our religion is, is, is easy. No, we have to be balanced. And the more knowledge that the person has, the more respect he'll know how, when to give to these different issues. Tomorrow, Ikhwani, we want to deal with this other issue, but I didn't want to open it up because we only have about seven minutes remaining, bi'idhnillah, and we need to give time for this. From the issues of a tashahud We'll come to the issue of a taslim after that because I wanted to do the taslim and I want to do the sajda tasahu and then move to another issue about the mistakes in the jama'at. So we'll deal with that bi'idhnillahi ta'ala tomorrow. So if you brothers have any questions, we'll deal with your questions for like two, three minutes, bus two or three minutes and that's it. Alindakum shaykh. تفضل يا أخي شمس الحق That's not an issue that we dealt with last week when we dealt with Al-Qiyam and I didn't say that was a mistake because there's proof for that for the people who see the permissibility of when you come from Rukur Sami Allah Liman Hamida Rabbana wa lakal ham Some people do the Rafi Al-Yadeen as you should do and then they put their hands on their chest. There's an authentic hadith, it's authentic, where the Prophet told his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the place of the hands in Qiyam is on the chest. The place of your hands when you're in Qiyam is on your chest. That's been narrated by those companions. So the people who see this as something that is the sunnah, they say when you come up from Roku and you're standing up, what position is that called? Huh? It's Qiyam, because you're standing up. So the hadith said, the place of the salat in Qiyam is on your chest. Because of the generality of that hadith, they put their hands on the chest. Other people said no. And this is one of the things why I don't accept Al-Albani's position about Moving the finger. Al Albani, he said, and it was a strong argument, he said that this hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about qiyam when you start your prayer off. Where do you put your hands? 
Allahu Akbar. The place of the hands in Qiyam is on your chest. So you put it there. So the fact that none of the companions, not a single companion came and said, when the Prophet came from Rukur, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he placed his hands back on his chest to show us the meaning of that hadith, that it means whether it's at the beginning of the prayer or after a rukur So when Al-Albani, he mentioned, he mentioned, I don't accept this. This is an innovation, he even said. He said, I don't make the people who do that innovators because some good scholars do that. A Shaykh ibn Baz, other than him, they do that. He said, but this is an innovation. If this was from the Sunnah, at least one companion would have come and he would have said, this is what the Prophet did. This is what he told us to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say, okay, I agree with that. But also with the tashahud and moving the finger. If that was from the Sunnah to move the finger, then you would have a companion come in saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly did that. And no companion said that. No companion. You have that narration that I mentioned, Zaida ibn Qudama. He said that Wa'il ibn Hajr said, that's what the Prophet did. But you have those narrations of those other people who were more than him, bigger than him. They didn't mention that moving. So it seems like his hadith is shad, it's an irregularity. So that is a point of ikhtilaf. If a person believes that's what you should do, then that's what you should do. I don't think that that ikhtilaf and the benefit from it, the fa'idah of it, is like the fa'idah of this issue. The fa'idah of moving. And that's because, again, as I mentioned, the way the people dealt with it is with respect between themselves. That younger person who came, he was a scholar, a sheikh in his own right. He didn't talk nasty. He didn't talk bad. He didn't shed any shuck doubt on the knowledge capability of an albani or people like him he just said hey i don't agree with that position and this is our way everybody is allowed to disagree with the person who's teaching them to disagree with the them you just have to know what you're doing and it's clear that every human being made mistakes in this issue or that issue except the nabi you sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam wa naktafi bihad al-qadr ونسأل الله عز وجل أن يوفقنا وإياكم لما يحب ويرضى سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we're going to deal with the subject of sahu tomorrow yeah yeah إن شاء الله it's Wednesday right it's Wednesday huh